Hello everyone, welcome to another A Healthy New Zealand podcast and today it gives me real pleasure to introduce Ivor Cummins. Um, Ivor is from Ireland and he came from a biochemical engineering background where he led teams in complex problem solving and I'm going to let him tell you the story about how he became such a worldwide influence on cholesterol and health. So welcome, Ivor. Thanks for coming. Great stuff, Susan. Thanks. Great to be here. <laughs> well, will I go ahead then? With yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and give us a bit of your background and, and how you yeah. ended up running the um, Irish heart disease awareness and yeah, the whole story. Oh. Okay, then I'll keep this piece relatively short, but uh, I did a biochemical engineering degree in 1990, and then I spent around 30 years in kind of technical leadership positions over worldwide teams and management roles, but they were always focused on complex problem solving, multi-factor, so very difficult issues, very subtle issues affecting multi-millions of dollars worth of product that had to be fixed quick. So I did that most of my career. And in 2012, then the health thing came up because I got some blood tests that were uh, way outside range. Doctor wasn't too worried, really. Uh, but I looked at the numbers and saw how far out I was. Uh, there was cholesterol. There was a liver enzyme, GGT, which is very important. And serum ferritin, which is a measure of the iron loading in the blood. And I saw that they were very, very far out. So I was more concerned than the doctor. <laughs> So I did what I always do when I'm brought into a new complex problem to take over a team. I asked two key questions. And the first one is, what are the implications of these bad uh, values in terms of morbidity or you know, mortality, uh, stuff like that? And the second question is, what are the root causes that would cause these things to be bad in my environment? Because I knew I wasn't some kind of genetic oddity because I never had any issues and I was in my 40s. Um, so I said, okay, there must be reasons that these would be high and I'll go fix them. <laughs> so I got, I didn't get answers really at all. Um, nothing that panned out. And I went to another doctor and grilled them, same story. And then I went to a very senior person, a professional who educates doctors and I didn't get much more. And then I realized there was something huge going on, um, not a conspiracy, but just so, something enormous, because I knew from my decades of problem solving that if the genuine experts have no real knowledge around basic uh, standard tests in the questions I asked, uh, there's something really wrong. I'm not sure what it is, something crazy going on. Wonder what it is. So I went and I got onto the research databases, my corporate logons, uh, ResearchGate, PubMed, and I began to research these metrics uh, and all the biochemistry and metabolism around them, the last 50, 60 years of human published studies. And within a few weeks, I had the answer, and it was carbohydrate metabolism. So basically, for people listening, you've got fats, you know, which are oils, fats, fatty foods. You've got carbohydrates, which are breads, pastas, orange juice, sugars, uh, vegetables, really. And then you've got protein, which is in both. And the carbohydrates, I realized, was a problem. I was eating too many carbohydrates, particularly whole grain, healthy breads, healthy whole grain pasta. I was drinking a lot of orange juice, which is kind of pure sugar, I discovered, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I was trying to eat a heart-healthy diet because I had five children. I was kind of focused on health. And uh, I realized then it had backfired, that they were wrong about the fat. The fat was not a problem, like we were told. The problem was excessive carbohydrate. So I stopped all the carbohydrate. I only ate starchy vegetables like, or non-starchy vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower. They're low sugar. Uh, I dropped the breads, the pastas, uh, the potatoes, the orange juices, any chocolate I was eating mostly. Got rid of all that. I began to eat meat, fish, eggs mostly, real food, real human evolutionary food. And within nine weeks, my blood test looked amazing. Uh, but I'd also lost uh, around 15 kilograms in nine weeks. And I wasn't even targeting that. You know, I was quite, I was a little overweight. And uh, my mental acuity got better and my hunger control became incredible within two weeks. I found out I could skip meals and keep working during the day without a second thought. 
And basically it was a transformation. And in engineering in a complex problem, you see that kind of phenomenon. So what you see is if you get the genuine root cause, the primary root cause in an issue, you'll find that not just the problem resolves on the production line, but you'll suddenly find out that the yield goes up on many different stations. So when you find a true root cause that's global and, and crucial, uh, when you fix it, it's not just your problem is fixed, many things get better. Uh, and I saw this and I realized, okay, I really got the big one here. And then I went and researched deeply into cholesterol because I discovered cholesterol was nothing like they told us. And I began to give lectures to 100 plus engineers and work about what the real problems are. It's not cholesterol, it's not fat, it's insulin. And uh, went on YouTube just for fun. And then I got this huge network came after me, doctors, professors, lay people. And, and it went from there. So the last seven or eight years, I ultimately ended up working for Irish Heart Disease Awareness. And um, I'm finished largely with that role now. And I'm more out on my own. But uh, that was because I was found by a, a guy who, who ran that charity, who had seen my lectures and just thought, oh my God, okay, this guy knows this stuff. So he brought me in to help get the message out. Yeah, well, you've done an absolutely wonderful job with that. I, on my website, I actually have links to um, The Widowmaker and the... Um, what was the last one you did? The um, oh, the last one was extra time movie. Extra time, yeah, that's movie. right. So we've got we've got links to that for people, and I've got a couple of your YouTube um, videos up as well, like cholesterol conundrum. I think was ah, one of them. That was yeah. the original one that got me all the attention. Yeah, I've done many, many since yeah. my YouTube channel. Yeah. But I think that's a very, very good one for people who want to understand the mechanisms, you know, and, and a bit more about cholesterol. So I'll just point that out now so people can go and check that out if they, if they want to learn a bit more. So that's an interesting story. And, you know, we're always told, aren't we, eat healthy grains and cereals, you know. Um, so can you explain for people why that is a driver of heart disease and why it's not saturated fat and cholesterol like we've been led to believe all these years? Yeah, okay. It's, um, well, the story goes back to the 1960s. Well, actually further, but let's start in the 60s where there was a belief that cholesterol was very intimately connected and drove heart disease, cholesterol in the blood vessels and in the blood. Um, and that was kind of mistaken, but they, they believed it. And then they got the idea that saturated fat and fats in the diet would drive up the cholesterol, which in turn would drive up the heart disease. So they got to believe that, particularly a man called Ansel Keys, who I believe was a fish physiologist and really wasn't a doctor or anything else, but he was very political and powerful. He got on all the big boards of the heart organizations and he ran what I would call junk studies uh, he ran studies across different countries in Europe, and he said, oh, look, more fat in the diet correlates or links to more heart disease. So they, these are worthless studies, but everyone loved them, and he grew in, in power and influence. So he established this myth about the fat, the cholesterol, and the heart disease. So that's just the way it stayed for 40, 50 years, because industry were being asked now to reduce real wholesome ancestral foods with fatty foods like meat fish eggs that stuff now a lot of it was fatty um, and they were being asked to make things with more carbohydrate because if you take away the fat the food becomes disgusting so you put in more sugars and carbohydrates and refined grains you know and wheat and vegetable oils man-made vegetable oils or <laughs> yeah, seed oils it's a whole so, topic on its own isn't it yeah well, if you just imagine, it wasn't a conspiracy per se, because the scientists, in fairness, got it wrong. There was a lot of dissent and people saying, hold on, this is crazy. But they were stamped it down by the official organizations. This is the way business works and academia. And then industry got a green flag to go and make foods now, fake foods, with the cheapest ingredients in the universe which are refined grain sugars and seed oils or vegetable oils. So they're the cheapest ingredients 
to imagine it's hard to imagine how cheap they are people don't realize how much how cheap they are I, I and they're being costs, asked to put sorry i was going to say i think it costs sense doesn't it to you know oh, I, I was in stuff. spain i was in spain the holidays uh, a couple of years ago and i just thought it was funny it was 10 euros or it's probably around 15 of your dollars uh for 10 kilograms a huge bag of a flower now it was on special but think of it that had to be grown in the fields, you know, fertilized, all the petrochemicals used. Then it has to be harvested, then processed through many steps, ground, bagged, transported. The supermarket has to get its cut and da 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 da. And it was like a dollar a kilogram. Mm. So that's how cheap it is. It's just, mm. it's be, and the same with seed oils, they, they cost yeah. nothing. So, Essentially, industry uh, just went crazy then, and for commercial purposes, they designed very palatable, very digestible foods that would be tasty with loads of sugars, refined grains, these fake fats, and uh, they basically filled the food system with dangerous food. Uh, and they were pretty much nearly asked to do it. I mean, it's ironic. Mm. And we had the ultra-processed food revolution from the 60s, 70s onwards, and now over 50% of calories eaten in the UK, across the whole of the United Kingdom, over 50% of calories eaten are ultra processed foods, not even a bit processed, ultra processed junk food. So, and the reason, the reason it causes such a problem is a couple of things. One, the real fatty ancestral foods and meats and eggs and all they're nutrient dense and you're getting a lot of nutrients per calorie and that that makes for a very healthy physiology these new foods are nutrient poor so that's one problem the other problem is what drives diabetes and obesity is primarily refined carbohydrates refined grains sugars and vegetable oils so there's a lot of mechanisms how vegetable oils drive these problems so these food supply items dominating our food supply are the worst foods in the world for diabetic type physiology to make you type two diabetic and overweight. And that's as simple as it is. You take out the good foods and you replace them with problem foods. And the way you know you've got a problem 20 years before you have a heart attack, the biggest thing driving heart attacks and vascular disease is insulin resistance, which people may have heard about it, insulin resistance. And essentially insulin resistance is having high insulin levels in your blood, especially after a meal. And insulin resistance really is type two diabetes. So if you're insulin resistant, you may not be diagnosed type two for another 20 years, but, but you are essentially type two diabetic. It's just that you haven't reached the threshold of being called it. So we now have in America, probably 70, 75% of adult Americans over 45 from the data are essentially type two diabetic, you know, only 15% are called type two diabetic, but around 75% are essentially type two diabetic and that high blood insulin and glucose spikes. That's the biggest single driver of vascular distress and, uh, are atherosclerosis and heart disease. It's not the only driver. There's lots of other things too, but it's the big elephant in the room. And cholesterol really just doesn't even get on the list. It's, it's so ambiguous and down the list. 